depending on where you are connecting from. Um, welcome to our session on um, IA and um, the pathway, right? Um, I'm so kind of excited to moderate this session and to delve into the discussion on IA. Of course, we've, we've had um, several existing discussions that are centered around that, but um, really um, excited on the path that we are moving into IA governance. We are going to look at policy and um, we are definitely going to have discussions on some of the challenges that um, we, we are facing. Now, um, before I introduce my speakers, um, why this session and why this topic? Um, of course, during COVID or I mean, when the COVID came, it became so necessary for us to really appreciate and um, um, kind of know how the internet is more relevant to us. Um, in those areas as well, there have been a lot of development on um, artificial intelligence. Um, some have been good, some haven't been good, but the major issue is on how um, it is governed. Um, it's quite a new area. Um, and a lot of people are navigating towards those areas, but we so kind of want to know what are the policies that um, have been put in place to to govern that. So our discussion will be centered around that. Um, I have three wonderful speakers. I'm here with two, and I have Joanne online. My name is Theo Rose I'm from Ghana, um, and I'll be the moderator throughout the session. On my right is Orabil. On my left is Umat. I'm quickly going to move to Orabil to introduce himself, followed by Joanne online, and I'll come to Umat. Uh, thank you, Theoros. I'm actually um, Warabile and a technologist and a policy researcher focusing on public interest technology at the intersection of digital governance, policy, and regulation. Uh, currently, I'm a member of the advisory committee to the African Internet Governance Forum. I also sit in the expert group of the African Union High-Level Panel on Emerging Technologies. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Joan? Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Jan Mazur. I'm from Poland, from University of Warsaw. I'm an assistant professor here, and I'm working in the area of law, especially in European Union law. And I also did some research in international economic law, which <coughs> governs new technologies with a special focus on data protection and competition law. Thank you again for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Umu Pajaro Velasquez. Uh, uh, I'm a consultant on, in artificial intelligence and ethics uh, developments. And also right now part of the gender standing group as a chair of the gender standing group from ISO. Uh, my main work or, or research right now is, is to find a framework that include digital rights for queer or gender diverse people into the different policies or regulations uh, that have been developing uh, in artificial intelligence in artificial intelligence around the world. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and to start this conversation about artificial general intelligence. Um, thank you. So I would want Bruce, who is our online moderator, to introduce um himself as well, if it's there. Hi, uh, I'm Bruce. Um, thanks for having me. I'll be on the online moderator. So if you have any questions anytime, just feel free to put them in the chat and then um, I'll speak up on your behalf. Um, yeah, this is an area I'm interested in. Um, looking forward to seeing where the discussion goes. Thanks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> So that out of the way, um, I'm just going to, again, just quickly jump into our first set of questions. Um, I would also want all of us in here to feel free to ask our questions and make any contributions and submissions as well. Um, we, we do really appreciate your input and all that. Um, I, as I said um, at the earlier part, right during the first set of um, submissions, um, I is really important that we cannot um, dispute that. We've been 
using it um, and uh, I mean in most developed countries it's really fully in session now um, moving to our bill as um, somebody who is uh, in the policy system right um, how do we um, harness the the synergy between all the stakeholder group I mean I'm talking about government civil society private technical and even academia which would fall under civil society how do we harness all those um, power really to contribute to a more ethical I yeah I mean uh, thank you so much Theoros for for that question I think for me the discussion really starts off when we have to literally framing AI through I, I mean my input in this discussion would really kind of uh, feed into the African narrative and looking at the developments that are emerging given the work that I've been doing uh, in the continent. So framing AI through uh, this African lens, uh, I think the continent is, is, is playing uh, a central role in the global AI supply chain. And we have almost become consumers and a testing ground for these kind of technologies. And at the same time, yet foreign uh, technology companies driving AI technologies uh, in the continent are dominating the region through public-private partnerships. We have also noticed uh, many African states that are uh, deploying AI-driven technologies and at the same time, not practicing open procurement standards and with this lack of transparency to how these technologies and products or solutions are, are functioning at a community or society level. But also, I just wanted to point out to one key challenge or one area that I feel needs to be discussed in this uh, setting, right, is the monopolistic strength of technology companies uh, that are driving, I mean, that are driven by monetary value through the supply chain models uh, and perhaps with added rental costs and surveillance capability, which I think establishes this new form of profit more profit-making uh, predominance, but at the same time, I think by, co by controlling and engineering this digital ecosystem, these companies or these big tech companies mostly, they dominate the technology architecture as well as giving them this direct cogency over the political, economic, and also the societal layers of life, which is, I believe, is a form of new sovereign control. But I think the main issue here on uh, is central around the policy inadequacy for yeah. Africa. While we are seeing this many developments and at the same time adopting these technologies, do we actually have uh, sufficient policy frameworks or standards to regulate how these technologies? Perhaps that's a question I would like to explore further in the discussion. Um, really, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you spoke about investment because I was actually coming into that and I'm throwing this to Joanne online. Um, now, one, one of the major challenges that um, we face really in all the sectors that the more private sectors invest um, financially into policy making or development of um, um, devices, they kind of seems to have control or some level of input really because it's they are investing in it. They kind of determined um, or they, it looks like they kind of determine the, the font or the, the stream that those things should go. So just to you, Joanne, um, what are some of the challenges that um, uh, we face again in the, um, in the area of ethical um, artificial intelligence when it comes to private investment and making sure that all the stakeholder groups are equally represented? Yeah, like, you know, I wish I knew the answer. Like, it would be great to, to have, like, perfect solutions for these challenges. But I think that one thing that has been missing for a while and it's only started to be somehow present in the debate right now for last couple of years is the fact that we used to treat new technologies as something that is like it's better to leave it unregulated and just to let it develop on its own pace in its own way and I think it's changing for the last couple of years and this is good that it's changing because we cannot let such important sphere of um, the economy and also the social life and political life 
to just develop on its own without any regulatory measures addressing the challenges and the risks that are connected to it. So this would be like the first thing that I would like to, to stress that uh, actually the presence of and the development of, uh, of regulatory measures concerning new technologies is quite important and this feeling of like being powerful in this regard and that the states actually do have the right to regulate new technologies is something that we should um, stress and acknowledge and follow this, this path. And the other thing which I think is important is that uh, we also sometimes tend to forget that, 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 that there are regulations in place which somehow would demand the AI tools to be aligned to certain human rights uh, or to certain values that we deemed like protected by law. And we have this tendency of treating technology and digital space as something particular where it's not necessarily that relevant these old traditional laws and rights and values and i think this is something that we also should somehow recognize that all the provisions concerning non-discrimination and so on so on they should also be considered as important if for when we are talking about the development of ai technologies and if the companies decide to implement or introduce such product products and services on the market all the requirements that actually are foreseen in already binding legal regulations should be also followed. So this is the second point. And the third point that I would like to make, make is that maybe it's also time for the states to actually become more active actors in terms of developing their own solutions. So instead of relying on private sector for the provision of services used in public sector and for the goods of citizens and so on, we could think about the way of uh, channeling the public investment into the development of sovereign technological solutions. So instead of treating the state as the client or the consumer of the products and services provided by the private sector, we should think about how can we assure that we'll have funds and resources to have our own public solutions, which would be more, for example, transparent, which would be more accessible, which would be based on more diversified types of data and so on and so on. So these would be the points that I think are important in this, in this context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, just move on um, to, to Umad. Um, we, so one of the challenges that um, we are really facing with this new innovation is its ability to really serve globally. So we've realized that some of the softwares are not able to recognize ascent. They are not able to recognize faces. Uh, they kind of lack um, some colors as, you know, not really because the, the innovation is not fully, but the, the, the whole idea is that it should be able to serve everybody globally, right? So now what can we do in terms of the innovation to make sure that uh, in terms of representation, it does represent every stakeholder group. In terms of um, jurisdiction, it does serve globally. Well, this, this is a question more related with well, what I call it right now, artificial intelligence governance. And it's kind of came to uh, uh, a way to solve all the problems related with artificial intelligence in, in, with a set of principles or values that actually serve to, the, to protect the different digital rights that people have and set a different uh, ethical frameworks or standards. Uh, right now, there is, uh, we can find some efforts. Uh, for example, UNESCO uh, has developed a set of principles that try to, the, with the day one that the, all the nation start to develop different policy policy 
policy frameworks related to those principles in order to protect the digital rights of the person, no matter their gender, sex, race, uh, ethnic background, or, uh, protect the human, the, the, the human rights in general. Another set of principles that we should look out also as an example of some effort of creating uh, artificial uh, in intelligent governance, uh, the OECD principles, and the G20 principles. Those one are also a part of all those efforts or including voices outside from the global north in the development of the or the different regulatory frameworks. Yeah. The idea behind all those or those different principles is that every country can adapt those one into their culture or the, into the the way of seeing the deans because technology, as you said before, is sure work and should serve to the people that are actually is going to be the beneficiary or the user of it. Thank you. Olavia, what do you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to add to that question as well, based on the point I highlighted to earlier on, on the issue of policy inadequacy. And I think it gives me pleasure to actually share on one of the interesting insights from the UNESCO AI policy uh, report we just finalized in the AI Africa policy, I mean, AI Africa Observatory project. Uh, what's really interesting about this is in the AI regulatory and policy mapping portion that we were doing, um, particularly looking at nine African, um, I mean, nine SADC countries, we kind of find out that, you know, the mapping included national AI policies, as well as provisions that are related to AI data processing, as well as automated decision making within ICT, uh, competition and consumer protection. But what's really interesting about the, the this study, uh, some of the reports, I mean, uh, preliminary reports or insights from the from the report is that, you know, they we have actually noticed uh, inadequate environment, particularly in many African countries where policies, legislative environments, uh, I mean, legislative instruments and uh, institutions uh, are lacking in context to define what exactly this regulatory framework should look like in regulating AI technologies in Africa. And we think that, you know, with this kind of uh, approach in Africa, there's still a lack of understanding standing, especially from uh, the government side, uh, which I think needs to be actually addressed from, from that. Um, yeah, we would, come, we would come to that, but um, I, I want us to move into um, another equally important area um, that is more on um, uncontrolled pursuit, right, of, of AI and, and all that. Now, in, in we spoke um, earlier, or we, we had the earlier submission on the role of investment, private sector investment, especially in, in how the, the, the innovations are um, are, are governed or um, are, are taken or handled, right? So just on the same um, lens of governance, but this time around, I want you to focus on um, the socioeconomic um, factors that actually affect the innovation and again is there enough resources uh, now let's before you go into that again let's have just a quick look into um, IOT I mean which is also in the same category as it is right um, uh, internet of things having smart homes that is a good option that is something that we should look at um, we don't even want to talk about the data that is, is there and how protected it is yet but it has to do with money and it has to do with a lot of investment um, do you think really that the developers first of all have enough resources to do that now if they don't do you think that the investment could have a positive a feedback on how um, the devices are controlled or how the, the um, those things are handled. Yeah, I mean, th thank you so much for that question. I think, uh, you know, when you look at the emerging debates in the global digital discourse around uh, AI or emerging technologies, uh, they are kind of cent centered around digital sovereignty, right? And the controversies around it, not only 
uh, in global north countries. We are actually beginning to see similar developments in global south countries who are also trying to assert their position uh, as opposed, I mean, uh, in relation to uh, the reactions of the global north countries. But the, the contested governance of emerging technologies, I think it is part of the emerging global di digital discourse through the lens of multilateral parties and is the result of a thorough understanding of benefits versus, I mean, benefits of the technology versus the implications in our society, right? And looking at it from a context of digital infrastructure development, however, I think we should understand within I mean, we should understand these arguments within the broader context of datafication as well as surveillance and digitalization, which is most of the batons that many uh, African, uh, basically governments globally are using to justify why they are driving this kind of uh, technologies, right? But the overlying governance and digital transformation on this already loosely used concept has, I think, the potential of blaring again this useful uh, distinction from a technology policy as well as the governance and legal perspective of what exactly is the enabler of citizens' benefits and at the same time the state's obligation to what uh, is open to abuse and exploitation, right? Mm -hmm. But third to that, and in addition to that, I think the shift in socio-economic and geopolitical dynamics of all these conversations, they have disrupted the, the traditional digital development agenda. Uh, that is respect for human rights, which uh, my colleague has already alluded to, as well as uh, respect for sovereignty in other countries, right? So towards this capital-driven business models and disregard of citizens' relation with this kind of technology. But also lastly to that point is the this powerful autocratic regimes that are trying to assert their developmental agenda demanding uh, greater flexibility and exceptionalism in the global arena uh, to how these technologies should be regulated globally. So most of these states actually contest the democratic values and their quest to control the internet and even the very same technologies we are discussing now in favor of economic development. And this has actually extended to safeguarding the elites of the, I mean, uh, wealth of the elites and uh, political patronage in some, some instances. Um, Matt, I would come back to you. Um, we um, spoke earlier on um, the, the fact that the devices, the, the artificial intelligence devices are not recognable in some part of the world globally, right? It's still under development. Um, what is your, your, your take on the global dynamic factor of that um, in terms of the development, those that develop the, the devices? Um, what, what are the dynamics? Is it more um, European, more African, what are the causes? Is it just because the understanding is not there and uh, uh, because that more um, people that faces that challenge are not the ones making the input when it comes to the development? Well, I uh, actually love this question because uh, I came from Latin America and, and I had this conversation uh, regularly about how the development of this technology uh, affects us in a way uh, that we implementing these technologies as it was something that actually was made for us, but it wasn't made for us. And actually we think uh, that we, um, I, would like to say, I would like to say that we're actually facing right now a new way of colonialism through this, this uh, implementation of these technologies in on everyday life. So we need to be aware of that before implemented those technologies in um, in all countries. For the, there is a several samples of implementations of uh, uh, or artificial uh, or artificial intelligence for the facial recognition technologies. Uh, how they can be biased towards different genders or towards uh, different races. Uh, also, there is another thing that. Uh, 
that we need to address here, as Joanna said before, the, we, not, we need to have a better correlation of the different data sets in order to include more visions of the world inside of those technologies. I think we are in the majority of the world. I prefer to use that term, not the global south term, because we are the majority of the world, literally. <laughs> we are the majority of the world. So, uh, uh, to use the to use all visions of the world embedded into this technology so we actually going to have this technology in a way that actually can benefit to all of us and and start to achieve the the this is balance of power that actually is happening in the development of these different uh, technologies because we have the resources and we even don't think we have the person the people that actually can develop that is as inside all those all countries. Probably we lack a political uh, volunt uh, we have a political will to do that. But mm -hmm. we had people that actually are developing this this kind of technologies in the global north because they can make it in the global in the majority of the world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, thank you. Now I'm going to move quickly to um, Joanne online. Um, I, I just want to know your, your take on this. Um, is there any um, existing or has there ever been any historical um, factor when it comes to um, when it comes to AI development? Is there any precedent um, that is there or something that had happened that I mean speak in favor or not in favor? In terms of using the data, for example, for the development of the solutions, we have the problem of like obvious biases that will be there when we use historical data sets to develop AI. It will probably replicate the, the biases that were there historically. And therefore, like I think there are two things that are that I would like to mention in this context. One is the fact that we need to support the solutions which would actually take this into consideration and or even not support but demand that the solutions that are implemented would take this into consideration. And then that the question is whether actually the development of these technologies can have like positive impact on equality. So can we make thanks to the technology solutions that would be more fair than the solutions which we have, which are based on human decision making, for example. And I would like to just briefly come back to the topic with which you started the whole, the, the, the whole round of questions and the smart home and the solutions that you gave as an example like this iot technologies and so on because i think it brings us to like very important issue of what are the solutions that the are developed and are actually needed what are the solutions that are needed but are not there yet and uh, what are the solutions that are available but are not only not necessary but also actually harmful for us because i think that the problem that we have is that we use the resources and we use the also the people who have competences to develop ai to work on solutions which are absolutely not necessary and don't make our lives better like you know all the chatbots that would discuss with us the possibility to buy something new and all the automated uh, calls that like the voice you know automated voice that actually recommends us to uh, buy something like does it really improve the quality of life of anybody or does it help us to provide more i don't know better health services or better housing or like we are missing i think the point uh, like we're missing the uh, the question of like whether the solutions that we develop will actually bring something good and this is something that i would very much like to change to take into account that we should focus on the areas and on the solutions that would actually 
provide something beneficial for the society and not only for, for the market. And therefore, I strongly support what was already said in this regard. Um, thank you so much, Juan. Um, just to wrap up before we take questions, um, I would again want to move to um, Arabil to now this time around focus more on um, redesigning um, the AI um, governance. Um, we started with speaking on AI in general. We streamlined it to um, the socioeconomic factors. We streamlined it into the different dynamics and if there are any historical traits or changes. We um, spoke um, extensively on um, the fact that the devices are fully not global, even though we want those ones global. Now, there, there has been this perspective, really, that um, the development in itself should be a multi-stakeholder approach, so that um, it should include all the stakeholder groups, um, and then it should include um, every um, age group as well, especially um, the youth, people in minority. Um, I mean, that it, sh it should have that merger that everybody, um, irrespective of where you are and where you belong to, that you do have an input in that. So now I would um, start with you again with your um, experience in AI policy, governance and all that. Um, do you think that um, uh, minority um, groups or youth are fully um, represented in, in this area when it comes to policy. Do, do the policies cover uh, those group of people a lot? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very good question and thank you for that, uh, Theo. First of all, I think there's still a lack of representation, especially for minority groups in the, in the space. But more specifically, I think it speaks to the transparency and fairness uh, in how policymakers are developing uh, policies in this policymaking process, right? Which kind of mediates between interests of all stakeholders, especially those that are in the global south. So I think there is still a, a gap there. But in terms of, uh, you know, speaking more on principles of transparency and fairness, I think many of the principles of transparency and fairness are, are just not important for AI and the representation of the minority, especially arguing it from a private sector perspective, right? Because these values are part of a larger umbrella of digital ethics in policymaking processes. Therefore, digital ethics is or becomes a crucial element in creating a better digital world that caters for all our stakeholder groups uh, that is fair, uh, fair and inclusive to all. But here is a metaphor I probably want to throw off to our participants in this session, right? Think of buying, uh, think of yourself buying a product in a store with a, a label showing all the nutritional values in its packaging or a guideline booklet of some sort to uh, an, an IoT product that you just ordered on Amazon, right? Wouldn't it be nice to have the same uh, approach in every IoT or AI-driven technology that comes packaged with a booklet indicating how that device process data? So that those are the m m minor issues that we might not really think uh, impact psychologically to how the society see and appreciate this technologies, but it makes a difference because it speaks spe specifically to issues of transparency. But at the same time, I, I tend to uh, also sympathize with the private sector in terms of how they are looking to approach this issue. There are, of course, challenges of implementing digital ethics, particularly from the private sector, which might come as though we are asking for more. But navigating the issues around transparency and fairness can be easier said than done, you know, because taking fairness as an example, how can it then be defined from a private sector perspective? How can businesses choose between what is fair to the customer and what is fair to the business? For example, in the eyes of a customer applying to a bank for a loan, 
uh, the fair decision would be to approve the loan for the requested amount, but the fair thing for the business would be to decline a customer that may be a risk to their investment prospects, right? Yeah. So those are some of the issues I'd really like perhaps for us to think about as we look at both sides. Great. Um, I'm going straight to Umat. I, I think the Rabil has listed some of um, the challenges that we are facing um, in, in the ecosystem currently. What um, are some of the practical solutions that we can implement to make sure that um, all, group, um, all groups are represented, especially um, the youth group and those that fall within the minority groups? Well, uh, this is Ken uh, and sadly in my earlier work. Uh, right now, I try to develop uh, like a framework where include minority groups, especially gender diverse, gender diverse groups, into the all the process of designing, development, and deployment of the different artificial intelligence, and how we can make that possible. Uh, one of the solutions that came to my mind is the participatory design. And that's, that this means not only the people going to be there to be asked what they need from these technologies, but also being from the beginning to the, to the end saying where is the process failing to achieve their, necess their necessities. So the technology that we have at the end actually is a response to the digital rights or the digital or the digital necessities of the people that are or the people that are, are historically not included inside of this process it, that usually is our minorities uh, are, are usually are people the different races or different uh, ethnic backgrounds or genders let me say another thing. Uh, another solution that actually came to my mind also is like uh, this this kind of technology had two parts. One part is the part of the we need to protect the the human rights. Mm -hmm. We know we need to protect the human rights, but also we need to guarantee that to the private sector they all, they're going to have some benefits from the, the technology they are developing. So right now I'm seeing in some countries that are doing something interesting when it comes to regulate the different uh, artificial intelligence in, the, in, in their own national laws. And those are the dashboard and the sandbox or, or of all regulation or policies. Those, we, we, uh, this kind of form or create regulations for artificial intelligence consists in trying some kind of experimentation of what, it, what can work in a, a small scale mm -hmm. in, order, in, no, in order to affect, to cause the less impact possible and to identify all the risks that actually can a product cause to, uh, to a specific population and then uh, decide, decide from that we kind of regulations is needed uh, uh, for the private sector to uh, release the product into the in, into the market. Great, um, thank you. I just want to check with Bruce if we have any question or um, comment in the house. Okay, I see one hand up. Um, Bruce, do you have any comment or question online? Uh, no, no, nothing here yet. Okay, so I would um, take the question. Joan, I'll come back to you um, for a submission. We, I could say, yes, sir. So. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much for giving me these opportunities. And uh, I'll have one question and one uh, uh, supplement or uh, my opinion. Uh, regarding the big data uh, management system, uh, I'm sure everyone knows that there is no one around this room now because we are talking about big, big, big problem and challenge. How we manage big data governance as UNIFC um, talking about uh, all the internet. So the internet is generating billions of messages and data every single minute. So how are we going to um, managing this? Uh, the first, my question, I'll 
or what do my question to you and then I will add some uh, strategies how we initiate both the government and private sector what I see here now is you talking about the policies and um, and also I'll mention a little bit about IOT and uh, IOE okay that's the one we were talking about the this are the one generating the data so uh, how big data government implemented in a global stage? That's my question to you. So my uh, uh, clarification is every country, the government and the private sector, they have the, uh, the working system framework, which is containing uh, environment, strategy, and infrastructure at the big level. Inside each, we have customers, we have product and services and processes and activities, and we have participants, in, and then we have information and technology. And those are the framework we need to develop for each country and practice for managing big data. And back to the IOTs and IOS, uh, what we see here is is the technology is driving the force. Uh, they're generating a huge amount of money because of AI. Uh, we have IOTs, which is integrated everyday things on the internet. An IOT application is collection services and software that integrated data service from various IOT devices. The use of artificial intelligence, technology, and data that helps yeah. make Thank the decision for the private and the um, public sector. Yeah. Yeah. So to implement this, uh, what yeah. we do is the IOEs is so machine to machine is, is a capability, and then people to machine, and also people to people. That's why these devices is working for. So. Oh. Uh, how yeah. we manage mm -hmm. all these big data? What yeah. are the strategies? Is actually in the, especially uh, uh, my brother, he yeah, mentioned so, the uh, south to south. Mm -hmm. So how we actually, an African, when I'm talking about African context. I, th I think that um, I would give that to Orabil to, to answer that for, for us, right? And then um, um, Joan could also add up onto that. Okay, thank you, sir, for, for that question. I think for me, they, they, from a general perspective uh, of how you're framing the question. For me, I think they, there is a need to provide uh, guidance to both private sector and the governments, uh, especially big players on the acquisition and operation of AI-enabled services that are data intensive in both the private sector, I mean private and public sector, including um, assessing whether AI is necessary and whether it's developing, uh, developing evaluative criteria and specification models that uh, guide on data processing within these technologies. But at the same time, I think we need to evaluate the technical and social impact of these technologies in the society. Uh, in addition to that, we need to ensure uh, a sustainable operation over the, the implementation life cycle, which I think speaks to uh, principles or standards of how data is stored in the system and at what point uh, are we supposed to destroy it from the data management system. So this should be perhaps accompanied by you know, establishing appropriate oversight mechanisms uh, to monitor uh, the data gathering process or the data development aspect of these technologies, its adoption and the withdrawal of AI-enabled services uh, whenever they violate data practices uh, if and when there are such legal uh, frameworks in a particular country. Great. Um, John, what do you want to add up? I actually wanted to go back to the question before, just to add one thing, because of course I do agree with the fact that we need some like specific solutions concerning the way in which we can get the 
minorities or majority or like groups that are somehow underrepresented in the AI based solutions which are being developed. Like, you know, the new innovative way to actually ensure their presence in this regard. However, I think it's also important to remember that we are also talking about the technologies which uh, are should be at least subjected to very traditional regulation and to very traditional conditions and the procedures and that the laws are enforced still in very traditional way and they are also made in very traditional way. So I think it's important that we also ensure that, for example, in regard to the enforcement of the rights and the process of preparing legislative proposals and in the process, of course, in the development of these solutions, like from technological point of view, we have proper representation and we have um, the right to participate in these processes of non-governmental organizations and grassroots movements and any of these kind of bodies because of course these technological aspects are very important but finally what we end up with is the need to enforce the rights or enforce the uh, regulations that are in place in regard to these new technologies and then all it all goes down to the question whether, for example, it is possible to represent somebody as non-governmental organization who defends rights of certain minority, for example, or is it not? And therefore, I think we should also include this very traditional and actually somehow boring dimension in the framework uh, concerning the governance of the inclusiveness of these this new technological solutions. So this would be one point that I wanted to make um, regarding the, the topic that we discussed before the question, comment question. And in terms of this, like mm, the state systems and so on, I think that uh, we are living in very difficult, like the fact that we are dealing with technically global solutions, which also are somehow particular in the local context and that they are unequally available, accessible, transparent, developed in various parts of the world. It makes it very difficult to think about the um, interplay between various layers of governance and regulation that we are dealing with and that uh, I would be very much for the development of rather global standards than the standards or on lower levels because I think that this is the way in which we can actually somehow face the challenges which are caused by global companies by addressing them on global level like this is the dimension on which we meet uh, and therefore i think that um, of course like it is also dependent on the states but it's uh, the the level on which we should be working on is the global one thank you uh, thank you so much um is there any more questions Either online or here. No, oh. none from online. Great. Um, then I guess I will throw it back to all our three speakers to just wrap up the session for us with their last remarks. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, in in closing, I would say stakeholders have uh, stakeholders have a joint responsibility in you know, ensuring that digital transformation processes are diverse, inclusive, and democratic, and that they are sustainable uh, in the long term. Commitment and strong leadership from public institutions uh, need to be complemented with accountability and as well as responsibility on the part of government and private sector um, actors. I think there's also a necessity to strengthen the multi-stakeholder approach in order to be truly inclusive and to develop effective uh, policies that respond to the needs of citizens, build trust and meet the demands of the rapidly changing uh, global digital environment. Thank you. Well, right now, around the world, there is a uh, different efforts or increase AI uh, governance. Uh, there are ways to, to develop, uh, implement some economic and ethical principles uh, and regulation that actually can work on only locally, but also globally, in order to uh, 
to have a, mul uh, a more multi-stakeholder approach to this topic and also have a more transparent, fair, uh, uh, accountable, and ethic uh, approach to artificial intelligence. Thank you, Joan. I don't know if I have anything to add to this, actually. So, Great. Thank you so much. Um, just before we wrap up, um, we've been having the discussion basically on the pathway to equitable AGI. Um, we had a discussion centered around three policy questions. The first one, um, um, I mean, in, in the area of AI governance, um, we had a discussion on diversity. We had um, a discussion centered around um, representation. And um, we had submissions on the role of various stakeholder organization in terms of policy development um, and in terms of implementation and um, how various uh, multi-stakeholder groups and people globally, especially um, youth and those that falls within the minority group could um, have that development. Then we kind of spoke on data protection a little um, when we were looking at the submission on um, um, artificial intelligence and um, IoT. And um, I mean, the, the, the issue of data protection is something that is still ongoing. Um, then we, we had a discussion again on investment, if um, socioeconomic factors um, um, playing a critical role on um, the development of um, AI um, devices, and if that um, had a massive impact on the developers. Then we finally um, centered the discussion around representation this time around, the fact that um, if development of the, the, the um, AI devices are uh, um, fully represented globally, and we concluded on inputs and submissions. Um, I would want to say a big thank you to those joining online and those here on site as well. Um, we are most grateful for your time and your presence here. We hope that um, the discussions will not end here, um, that we welcome feedbacks and uh, more input. Just in case you go back and you still want to make input, um, you could always do that. Thank you so much. Um, do have a nice evening, nice day, morning, and... Yeah, be great. My name is Dioris. Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye for now. Thank you.